sentencing men of color, but I cannot find any cases really, uh, either I can't find any cases or the cases have very little information and it's very, very frustrating. arrived in the ATL, Monica got a job working as an ex 
exotic dancer, but that only lasted for a few months. By 2007, she was working as an accountant for a handful of clients, however. She also was the owner of two businesses, an event planning and promotions company, and a clothing boutique. On June 20th, 2007, Monica and her fiancé, Shanada Rico Walters, found themselves on the wrong side of the, wa the law. The two were facing felony charges following an incident where police searched her vehicle and located a firearm and marijuana. At the time, Walters was driving the vehicle because he was borrowing the car. When questioned by police, Monica was adamant that she was unaware that there was a gun and drugs in her vehicle. She had never been in trouble with the law before, and after an investigation was completed, the charges were dropped against both Monica and Walters. However, Walters was taken into custody because he was on parole after serving two years for a drug conviction. The handgun located in Monica's car while he was operated the vehicle was a parole violation. Two weeks, sorry, two weeks after the couple was arrested on those felony charges, it was the afternoon of July 5th, 2007, when Monica had a meeting with a lawyer. According to his account, she seemed, uh, she didn't seem out of sorts and appeared to be acting normally. Later that evening, between 11 p.m. and 11.15 p.m., residents at the Lennox Apartments in Atlanta heard a woman screaming for help in the parking lot. Five witnesses checked to see what was going on and saw a woman being abducted. The witnesses shared with police that Monica was taken by two men described to be in their late 20s or 30s. One of the men was said to be heavy set with a beard. The vehicle they were traveling in was a maroon colored 2002 Mercury Sable. One witness on the scene had the wherewithal to write down the license plate before calling the police. Upon arrival, investigators found a number of items in the parking lot. There was jewelry a manila folder, food items, a pair of eyeglasses, a broken perfume bottle, a woman's green jacket, and two broken fingernails. Police were able to locate the vehicle the following day. However, according to the Charlie Project, the car had been burned and set ablaze. Two days after Monica was kidnapped, arrested a man named Jasper Keels. He was charged for stealing the Mercury Sable because, during the investigation, police learned that Keels borrowed the vehicle from a friend but never returned it. While he was initially only arrested for theft, two months later, investigators tacked on the kidnapping charge. Detectives don't know if Kiels knew Monica personally, but they do think that her abduction had something to do with the drug activity. There have been no arrests in connection with her, uh, her death, and there have been no leads to indicate where her body may be located. Yet, investigators do believe she is deceased. Walters was in jail at the time of Monica's disappearance, and her family nor investigators believe that he was involved in his fiancé's kidnapping. At the time of her disappearance, Monica was 5 foot 4 and weighed 135 pounds. She has brown eyes and brown hair. She was last seen wearing a dark green dress shirt and blue jeans. 
She has braces on her teeth and both of her ears are pierced. Rochelle Battle The last person in Rochelle Battle's family who heard from her was her mother, Ladarsha Kagi. It was in the early month of March 2009 when the 16-year-old made a call at 10 p.m. to tell her mother that she had taken the subway to East Baltimore because she wanted to drop by the East Point Mall. Rochelle assured her mother that she wouldn't be out late and would be home as soon as she was finished. However, whether Rochelle was really on her way to go shopping remains a mystery because the call she made to her mother wasn't the last call she made that evening. Rochelle rang a friend and told her that she was with a white friend of hers, leaving many to believe the mall story was a ruse, and that white friend may have been 34-year-old Jason Matthew Gross, a local acquaintance of Rochelle's. As it grew later into the night, Rochelle's mother began to worry. She repeatedly called her daughter, but there was no answer. The first call rang until it went to voicemail, but when she tried it again, it was evident that the phone was turned off. Yet, after she was reported missing, authorities were able to track Rochelle's phone and pinpoint that around 9 p.m. she was with the girls as the two were in the exact same area. As the investigation developed, there were witnesses who stated that they observed Mich Rochelle exiting an MTA bus. Something just fell and it scared me. It was ultimately Rochelle's phone that led her family and investigators to Gross's home. According to Gross, who has previous convictions for sex offenses and assault, he met Rochelle online in an adult chat room and solicited her for sex. He said the two agreed to meet at a bar near his rental home, but he claimed she never showed for the appointment. Detectives believed that Gross wasn't telling the truth and that Rochelle did meet up with Gross where he had sex with or possibly sexually assaulted the teenager before killing her. Many think that Gross disposed of Rochelle's body in the industrial incinerator he had behind the home. In April 2010, Gross was arrested in a connection with the disappearance and death of Rochelle Battle. He vehemently denied that he had any involvement with the teenager, but his pleas fell on deaf ears. The father of four was convicted of Rochelle's murder and was sentenced to 30 years in prison. Gross received an additional 10 years for unrelated sexual offenses against another victim. Latarsha was able to address the court and Gross when she wrote her victim impact statement, but it was Rochelle's father. Marvin Battle read it aloud. She acknowledged that her daughter had her faults, but her life was taken before she could have remedied for her mistakes. She also said that her daughter wanted to one day become a business owner and loved writing poetry and cooking. Gross's sister Angela spoke up on her brother's behalf, as did a longtime family friend, Elizabeth Bennett. They both have been vocal about Gross's innocence and claim that he is an excellent father and stand-up citizen. I've known Jason for 20 years and don't believe that he did this, Bennett said. I trust him implicitly. I, I've even let him watch my young niece. Rochelle has never been found and her body has never been recovered. Joanna Wright In the winter of December 2009,
2016, Joanna Wright was going about a regular day in Chicago, Illinois. Joanna grew up in the Marquette Park area and worked as a hairstylist. As a staple in the local LGBTQ community, Joanna was pop popular in her neighborhood and was said to be well-liked. That's why what happened to her just a week before Christmas Day leaves her loved ones sad and confused. It was around 1.45 p.m. in the afternoon of December 18th when Joanna was last seen being forced into a vehicle by three or four unidentified men. She was screaming for help during the abduction and attempted to fight off her attackers, but they got the upper hand and were able to over overpower her. The, scar, the car sped off, and Joanna hasn't been seen or heard from since. We all have that feeling that she's still here, Joanna's mother, Alicia Roberts, told ABC7. At the time of her disappearance, Joanna was 33 years old and is described as having long dreadlocks to the middle of her back with red dyed tips. She stands at 5 foot 2 and goes by the nicknames Jojo, Gino, or Duop. She has brown hair, brown eyes, and numerous tattoos that cover her chest, arms, and hands. Some include words like Londa, Joseph, Mary, and D-Unit. The car Joanna was thrown into during her kidnapping is reported to be a newer model, Blue Mazda with Ohio license plate plates. Investigators attempted to locate Joanna, Joanna by tracking her cell phone, but they were unable to retrieve any information regarding her whereabouts. In addition, Joanna isn't the only person to go missing from the Market Park area during that time. Marlo Gully, a 26-year-old friend of Joanna's, went missing in October. Another acquaintance, 20-year-old Shantae Bohannon, was also listed as a missing person until her body was found stuffed in a garbage can on the far south side of Chicago. Community activists in the area believe that all three cases are linked. Not knowing anything, that's what hurts, said Joanna's sister Valencia Harrison. Kayla Swanigan Could domestic violence have turned deadly for a young mother? are trying to piece together what happened to Kayla Nicole Swanigan from Detroit, Michigan, who went missing in October 2018. Her aunt, Sabrina, told a Fox to Detroit that the last time she saw Kayla, the 24-year-old had a black eye and was being shoved in a vehicle by her abusive boyfriend. She studied saying that it's okay, auntie, it's okay, Kayla's aunt said, but he's sh shoving her in a car and that's not okay. Sabrina also stated that Kayla's relationship with her boyfriend was a volatile one, even escalating to an altercation where Kayla shot him in the summer of 2018. The two would break up for short periods of time only to get back together. I'm fearing that he has killed her, Sabrina said. She shot him. What would you do if someone shot you and came back to you? On the day Kayla disappeared, she was at home in Detroit with her daughter and a friend. She left around 2.30 p.m. telling that she was, uh, telling them that she was leaving to meet up with a male friend on the west side of the city. were able to talk to the man that Kayla was scheduled to meet, but he told them that she never showed up. According to Sabrina, when she spoke to police, she was told that the boyfriend violated his parole and was on the run, but they were doing their best to find Kayla. 
speak up, said her grandmother, Shirelle Harris. 